safe on Tonys and Oscars and Emmys and Grammys. There's no red carpet because they're home in their jammies. From Melrose Place to Broadway to Janeway and her crew. Let Seth and James bring all the stars to you. Anywho. They're entertaining everyone, so who's going to grouse? Just sit right back and you'll hear some tales on Stars in the Hello, welcome to Stars in the House. I'm James Wesley. Do I look like a tablecloth? Is this like a little a, bit a, a Italian it's, restaurant? It's, it's very summery, Seth. Very right. summery. Trying and by the way, out. how old is that shirt? Oh, uh, literally, even my new shirts are like five to ten years old. I'm literally this is. I think I think you shirt. had that shirt the entire time I've known you, which is like 13, 14 years. Second husband. Anywho, <laughs> um, hi guys, welcome to Stars in the House. This is the fundraiser that we do for the Actors Fund that began when everything shut the hell down last March. March. And a lot of people think it's a, uh, the Actors Fund is just for Broadway actors. It is, first of all, not just for Broadway, and second of all, not just for actors. It's and not just in New York or LA. Correct, Mundo. It is for anybody that makes their living in the professional arts. So yes, people on stage in front of the camera, but everybody backstage, behind the camera as well. That's right and caterers and publicists and ushers and wig makers and orchestra piano players like I am. By the way, why is this piano playing? I just play violin. The point is anybody that needs help, how can they get help in the Actors Fund? You can go to actorsfund.org. Um, if you are able to give, go to starsinthehouse.com. It's scrolling right there at That's the bottom. That's you can donate. That's right, to donate. Or you can text fund2020 to 56512. You'll get a receipt from the Actors Fund. Forward that receipt along with the message that perhaps for someone from the Bob Newhart yeah. show or Newhart. Um, and you forward it to donations. Oh, Bob stars Newhart himself. That's right. And forward it to donations of stars in the house. Okay. I'm so excited. Yes. We said Bob Newhart when, um, when, when his team reached out to us, thank you, Jerry, um, to say, what do you think about Bob Newhart being on the show? We were we like, we respond for a couple of weeks. We had, we had <laughs> so to research not true. his oofa. I've never responded oh, okay. faster <laughs> to an email. of. of yeah. I, we thought it was a mistake. It was like, it's like, like Really? Like Robert Newhart, like someone like that's not famous, but it was actually literally the Bob Newhart. Because I mean, I, I mean, I grew up with Bob Newhart as a kid. I figured out this uh, as a kid. I grew yes. up with the Bob Newhart show. As an adolescent, I grew up with Newhart. So it's like basically as an adult and, elf. That's right. As, well, for Julie, that's that is true. Our kid, who's who's twenty, um, she knows Bob Newhart from from Elf, from his uh, from later works, I guess, as it were, yes. right? Post. But anyway, go back to the actress fun. Our new total is as this is all the money that we raised for the actors fund from viewers like you. That's right, eight hundred and ninety-two thousand one hundred and twenty-five dollars. We are so close to one million dollars. Hold on, can I play something exciting? Wait, sorry about the clams because I'm trying this way and trying to yes. play. Well, the point oh, is, and it, the point is, and and by the way, I don't think that includes all of. We had so many matching donations, and the actors fund is so careful that we that they're not calculated into our total They're very conservative they get the money we need a new accountant apparently bob newhart has a degree in We're accounting talk about that. and he said he is a horrific accountant so we will be discussing that so with him as far as we know we may have already passed the nine hundred thousand dollar mark but if you know we can actually just do it in donations today and then that will be a yeah, would that be exciting? So make sure you donate wanted to point out a friend of mine stacy oristano um was reading people magazine and just happened to say hey you guys are in it that's from when we were had ER um, two weeks ago. Yeah. So um, so we're famous because we have a picture of people. We may not be for very long, and we'll we'll talk about it with Dr. LaPook. Um, the whole announcement about Broadway reopening. This, these may be our final shows. I don't know. Yeah, Broadway's I mean, supposed to be coming back September fourteenth, and uh, you know we said we're going to keep going until Broadway comes back, but that's still pretty far in the future. So we're going to keep going for right. a while. And, right, and there are a lot of. There are a lot of questions, as, as there are with this. Correct, thing. Mundo. So we will we'll talk to Dr. Lapook about it. Who are for those of you who are new, Dr. John Lapook, the chief medical correspondent of CBS News, um, gives us medical breaks and has since day one, March sixteenth, twenty twenty, and will be here about midway through. Actually, he'll be the um, in between shows, in between the Bob Newhart show right. and Newhart. But first, he's the amuse bouche. We have to start with Bob Newhart himself. So Seth, please. All right, are we are we ready for like one of the most famous comedians ever and an icon and an influence? He's an Instagram influencer without the Instagram, but he is an influencer. Please <laughs> welcome the brilliant Mr. Bob Newhart. <laughs> Hi, Bob. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> First of all, where are you? Are you in uh, California? The what? Are you in California or back in your hometown of Cincinnati? Uh, let me look around. 
Uh, California, I think. Yeah, California. So the master of the pauses really takes the situation. <laughs> So, Bob, you know, Seth was talking about accounting. I couldn't believe it when I read that that you really got your degree in business and then you were an accountant first. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I was an accountant for about um, for about two years in Chicago. And uh, I graduated Loyola University and uh, with a degree in accounting and uh, worked as an accountant and um and, and found out I wasn't cut out for it. And I just had to, people, you know, kept saying, you know, hey, you're funny, you know. And uh, so I had to find out whether I was funny, whether I could make a living uh, in comedy and um, left accounting and, uh, and bounced around. I thought for a year or two and it turned into more like four. And, uh, and, and that was, uh, 61 years ago. So. <laughs> wow. So hold on. Let me ask a couple of questions. Like when I would be in an orchestra pit playing piano and I'd be cracking my sassy jokes, it was always a lot of like, he's driving us crazy. Someone tell him to be quiet. So were you like that in the accounting office? It was like, stop making jokes, Robert Newhart. You're bothering us. Or was everyone like, he's so funny. Let's hang out with him. What was your, what was your attitude in the office? No, I was, I was the guy um, on the edge of the crowd, you know, I, I wasn't a guy with a lampshade in the middle of the crowd. I was on the edge of the crowd and I would turn to the guy next to me and I would tell him something. And then he'd tell the lady next to him. And then, uh, and, and then people would keep saying, what, what do you say? What do you say? What do you say? No, I was never the, no, I was never the class clown. No. You were like, the I, I'm the still doing it. I think in a, way, in a way, I think I'm still doing it. It's your style. And let me ask you something because um, you're not Jewish, but I think if I dropped out of being an accountant and went <laughs> into show business. I'm not, I'm not Jewish. I don't want to break the news to you now. Let me just say, <laughs> it's still, still oh. with the pausing. <laughs> <laughs> Consult your rabbi later. Is that who you're looking for? Your actual rabbi? Well, what the, what, what the hell was that whole operation thing I went through? <laughs> First of all, <laughs> keep it above the belt. Second of all, my point is, Jewish parents would have a breakdown if their CPA child went into show business. Did your parents have like a Judaica breakdown or were they like, go, be happy in show business? Um, I would say no. They were no what? Because they gave you a choice. They were, <laughs> they were happy or not happy? <laughs> they, uh, no, they didn't know what I was doing. They, they right. had no idea. Um, uh, in fact, my my mother, someone would say, How, "How's Bob?" and they, and she would say, "He's uh, he's in radio. I had a syndicated radio program." And she would say, "He's uh, he's either in radio, or he fixes radios. He, he he has something to do with radio, but they had no they had no idea what what I was doing." So. Did they? Ever get to see you on TV, or they were sort of mystified? Oh, yeah. the oh no, no, they lived. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, I was working in Vegas, um, and my dad and mom came out to Vegas in the, the middle of the summer. It was like 115 degrees, and uh, and and they, yeah, that's, they saw me on stage in uh, in mm. Vegas. They must have flipped out. I want to show one of your early clips. Um, it's very interesting. I, I want to talk to you about this too because your stand-up comedy. It wasn't, you know, jokes. They were these really written scenes. I mean, you're really, a, besides just a great actor, you're such a writer. So this is one of your earlier bits where you're talking to R.J. Reynolds about, um, you know, when he discovers tobacco and you're having this one-sided conversation with Reynolds about what yeah. tobacco, or tobacco. Here, let's listen to it. <clears throat> let, let, me, uh, let, let me just just make sure I, I have this right now, Walt. You're, uh, you're, you're, you're sending us 80 tons of leaves. Is, is that right, Walt? Huh? <laughs> Walt, this... Uh, this may come as a, a little bit of a surprise to you. Um, see, come come fall here in England, Walt. Yeah, we're we're, we're sort of up to our. It, is, it isn't that sort of leaf. Uh, it, it it has a lot of different uses. What what uh, what are some of the uses, Walt? Since since we are getting eighty tons of this stuff. Uh, what, Walt, are are you saying snuff? Uh huh. What 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 is snuff, Walt? You. You, you take a pinch of tobacco <laughs> and, and, and you shove it up your nose, Walt. 
<laughs> and, it, and it makes you sneeze. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I guess, I, I guess it would at that, uh, wouldn't it, Walter? <laughs> Gee, a, a goldenrod seems to do it uh, uh, pretty well here, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> great joke so it's it's so written it's such a monologue did you ever you know, think about there was there was a whole in like the late 50s early 60s there was a whole sea change in in comedy in, in stand-up comedy uh it was uh mike and elaine uh, shelly berman um lenny bruce uh johnny winners myself mm -hmm. um and and it, it that's what we were doing. We weren't we weren't telling jokes. We were doing, I I guess for a lack of a better word, we, they were like vignettes, and and they were little acting jobs, you know. Right. They're really so brilliant. I mean, did you ever think that you were going to be just a writer? Because it is it's literally like script writing. Did you think you were going to do that instead? Yeah, at some point, uh, this was like three or four years in when I decided to give up a, a comic. And, and you guys I had gone to school with, um, they were getting married and uh, having kids. And, and I was working, I was taking part-time jobs, you know, trying to find, trying to break into comedy. And uh, and and I, uh, I just, I, I was thinking to myself, Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, nothing's going to happen. Let's face it. Um, so maybe uh, I said, maybe I'll become a comedy writer. I'll write material for other, for other people. And so there was a, a comedian, fairly well-known comedian. And um, I tried to sell him this piece of material. And he said, uh, he said, Oh yeah, thank you very much. He said, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get away from that particular car, but anything, you come up with anything else, let me know. So I, so I, I felt kind of encouraged, you know, well, he liked it. So so I'm watching um, a Steve Allen show. Steve had a show opposite uh, the Ed Sullivan show. And uh, and there was this comic uh, doing my routine. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that I had tried to sell him. And so, well, but he did me a favor. I mean, we became friends, very good friends later on. Uh, but then I said to myself, well, if they're going to steal it, I'm, I may as well keep doing it myself. And so he kind of encouraged me to to keep doing stand-up. Wait, are you still keeping his name a secret 68 years <laughs> later? <laughs> it's a long statute of limitations. <laughs> All right. Thank you, God. At what, at what point, Bob, did you think, oh, I, this would be I, – I should be on a on a sitcom. I mean, uh, you it was such I feel like the golden age of beginning of, of sitcoms with the Dick Van Dyke show and I Love Lucy and all those. Did you envision yourself doing a half hour show? Well, no, I I, I was doing at that point. Uh, I made a, a comedy record, uh, which went which became album of the year in 1960, and um, so I I was doing stand up. Um, and, and um, Arthur Price, who was with uh, MTM, uh, Mary Tyler Moore, uh, he he said, "Would you be interested in doing uh, situation comedy?" And I said, uh, "I said, yeah, yeah." I had we we had Jenny and I had, I think, three kids at that point, wow. and uh, I was on the road a lot, you know, and I, yeah. I wanted to have kind of a normal normal life. So um, I said, "Yeah, I'd love to." And um, so he put me together with two writers that uh, who, had, who worked at MTM, uh, one of which I had worked with uh, before. Who, uh, he was a, a writer named um, Lorenzo Music. And it, this reminded me of a, of a story. We were, we were doing the, the pilot for the Bob Newhart show. And he, uh, he, he came to me and he said, uh, you know, it, it's running a little long. Uh, you know, can can you, you know, kind of run the speeches together? And, and I said, Lorenzo, I said, this stammer, he got me a home in Beverly Hills, so <laughs> you, you better take some of the words out because I'm, I'm not going to change the stammer. It's your signature. <laughs> oh, well, on that note, I think that's a perfect that so segue funny. into the Bob Newhart show and our two, our two, like, we, we were like, we're calling this Bob Newhart and Friends because you've got friends here from both of your shows. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. I haven't seen some of them. Peter, I, I see every every so often. I haven't seen 
uh, Jim Burroughs in a long time. But uh, And I'm looking forward to, of course, later in the show when we're, we're doing new art to see the, the rest of the the rest of the cast. Yes. Um, well, okay. Well, Jimmy, I see, I don't see your Jim Burroughs. I assume you're here because you have your camera off, even though you're a director. So we're about to bring you on, yeah, Mr. Director. Jim Burroughs, I'm bringing you on. So turn your camera on. This you're, is what we see right now. Literally just a blank screen. Okay, Jim Burroughs. <laughs> thank you. Dramatic <laughs> entrance. Hi, Hello, Jim. Robert. How are you? Very good, Jim. Oh, <laughs> great to see. You. Jim we're gonna, out, of course, Jim went on to greater things after the Bob Newhart show, uh, Taxi, and uh, and so on and so on. Probably has, has directed more hit comedy shows than anyone else, I would guess. Oh, you're very kind, but uh, you uh, you uh, strengthened my legs there by doing your show. <laughs> uh, you know, I started out. I, I did, I did, I did a couple of Marys, and then I came and did your show, and I had the. I had to, I was directing my legend because in uh, in college I had the button down mind album and everybody came into my room to listen to it because it was just extraordinary. Well, you know, you uh, you paid me an enormous compliment uh, when you said your dad, Abe, Abe Burroughs, uh, when he when you said he he enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, he sent me the album. He was one of the best. He, oh, he, thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, of course, of course. Abe Burroughs was a, a a show doctor. They used to call him a show doctor at mm -hmm. that time. It's amazing yeah. history. And uh, Jim Burroughs went on to do Friends and uh, Will and Grace. He's the go-to comedy director. But let's talk about um, orthodonture. Here is our <laughs> dentist of the night. That's right. Peter Bonners. <laughs> Hi, Peter. Hi, hello, hello, there's hello, Peter. Hello, hello, Bob. Hello, Jim. Hi, Pete. Nice to see you guys. And hello, Peter became Seth a director. Peter became. We, we, a director. we all became directors. He still, well, he studied under Jim. Uh, he would ask. We, he'd be kind of light in the show, and he'd uh, ask Jim, "Why'd you take that shot? And why'd you do this?" And uh, and uh, he became a director of, a, of of several hits himself. Peter, yes. do you know how many episodes of the Bob Newhart show you directed? You directed a lot. Uh, I, I I counted once. Uh, I it was 130, 140, a bunch. Oh my God. And I think the reason that I was uh, taken on as a director and was able to stay as a director is I was quick. Uh, we started the show at 7.30 and we were through about 9 o'clock. <laughs> and then we all went out to eat and drink. <laughs> Every single week, but as long as I could get Bob out of there by nine thirty or so, I was invited back. <laughs> uh, truly, I think that's the only reason that he allowed me to uh, direct his shows. But it was one of the most memorable things. Well, certainly the memorable thing in my life. Well, I think uh, Jimmy. I think Jimmy. It, I drove Jimmy crazy, but uh, you know, it, it's just doing stand-up. You're so used to the immediate gratification. That uh, you know, I remember we we'd read a script on Monday, and if it was really good, I wanted to do it that night. I didn't want to wait till Friday. Right. Night. You know, that was one of the juggling. That was one of the done. juggling things that uh, Jim and I had to deal with because we were working with uh, other actors on on the show, people like Suz, Suzanne Plachet, who was a, a trained actress, and uh, some of the other As people opposed who to, were. As opposed to who? You. <laughs> no, no, you're a wonderful actor, but you weren't trained by uh, a highly qualified New York. <laughs> yeah, Sandy Meisner trained her, or so she says. <laughs> anyway, we had to accommodate uh, the actors and Bob, because Bob literally could have shot the show an hour after uh, the first table read. He just had to put his suit and makeup on. But Suzanne wanted a little rehearsal. Jack Riley needed about four days to memorize his three lines. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it, it was, uh, it, 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 the Bill big Daly. thing Bill was, Daly needed it was a few fun. Days, yeah. Bill, yeah, I mean, Bill Daly never learned his lines. He's, still, we, he's I, dead now. He doesn't, doesn't know them yet. I mean, it was our, it was our job. I'm sure Peter will agree with it. Um, uh, on the shows we did with Bob, we you had to keep it fun. If it was, if it began to drag out or anything like that, it, it was not fun anymore. And, uh, 
that was one of the key ingredients to that show. It was, uh, the stage was wonderful. The actors were wonderful. Even Peter was wonderful when he wasn't directing. <laughs> and, um, uh, you, you know, and Bob, you had, with Bob, you keep it fresh. So I remember once I said to Bob, um, I rehearsed it twice. I said, can I do it again? And Bob said, no. <laughs> <laughs> because the, he, had it at the, he had it at the first take. Peter's right. We did a second take um, uh, just, to, just as insurance. There, there were quite a few shows, whole shows, where we actually didn't do second takes, Jim. Entire and shows? Was, uh, oh, no, 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 no. Whole scenes. A but, whole scene. But we just, we just trusted. I would go around with three cameras. We only had three cameras, 35 millimeter film. I said, you get it? Did you get it? Did you get it? They checked check the lens for hairs and bang. We, we, there were quite a few shows where we had first take scenes. And if, if uh, the lab screwed up, they would pay for just another piece of film. <laughs> but we could always retake it next week and then plug it in. Uh, we had about, I don't know, two weeks lag time between. It was wonderful in those days. Uh, reaction time. When I asked, I asked the editor, what's a, what's a reaction for laughs? And he said, oh, it's about this long. <laughs> 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 it was, in those days, it wasn't nanoseconds. It was physical. It was 24 frames a second well that's how peter, old we are <laughs> peter i would think and and bob and jim i would think that part of the reason why you went so fast is because everything i've read is that this cast really really got along they all of you loved one another and obviously it's led by bob who everything i mean seth's seth's reading his book all right a little plug here all right, uh, in the middle. And he's like, reports to me every two pages about what's going on. No need for me to read it because he's been reading it and telling me everything. It just seems like the friendliest group. I mean, Jim, you've directed so many series also. It's like, is that true out of the, out of all the shows? Like Bob Newhart show is probably at the top. Yeah, and what cast hates each other? That's the second no, question. No, we're not asking that. We're a friendly <laughs> show. But what would, what would you say, Jim, all these years later about the cast looking back? Um, well, I've been on a lot of shows where the cast doesn't like one another and I don't I'll do one show and that's it I uh, uh, I I tend to uh, well now in, in those days when I first started out you had to uh, you had to deal with the cast the way it was and I was just a pisha you know coming from New York I was a stage guy and so I had to learn the ropes of dealing with these people so I watched the New Heart show for about two or three months to see what the dynamics were. But they, you know, they, they accepted me. Uh, I, I tend to be, I tend to make a lot of suggestions. A lot of them are good and a lot of them are bad. It's not my job to figure out which is which. It's somebody else's job. The and other thing, the other thing that Jimmy did, which not all directors do, is he actually watched us work. He didn't look at the script. Right. He, he didn't look at the writers and the producers and the people from the studio. He actually sat right in front of the actors and he watched them and he laughed. <laughs> in other words, he was an audience. Hmm. Not all directors are good audiences. Jimmy is a great audience. I, I appreciate that, Peter. Thank you. I, I try to, uh, I try to be a, um, a conveyor belt between the actors and the writers because it's such a writer's driven medium that, uh, you know, the actors sometimes don't get the respect they deserve. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Speaking for <laughs> actors. Speaking we had great actors. writers. We had great writers. Can we talk about the late, great Marsha Wallace? I loved her so much on the show. What was oh, she dear. like to work yeah. with? You know, the one thing about the Bob Newhart show, <clears throat> I had worked with Peter in uh, Catch-22, so I knew he had, uh, and, he, and Peter had been with the committee up in San Francisco, an improv uh, group. So every everybody on the show had worked in front of a live audience. Marsha had done it. Susie had done it. She'd been on, on Broadway. Uh, Bill Daly had done it. Peter had done it. Jack Riley had done it. Um, because it was very important. We did the show in front of a live audience. Yeah, and 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 they. I wanted people who were used to that 
experience of working to a live audience. Um, and, and everybody on the show had that live experience. I love that. The theater doesn't get a lot of respect sometimes in Los Angeles. I like that, that you respected the theater, the theater training of people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have so many great clips. I have to show the sassy. Um, this is Peter and <laughs> March. It really made me laugh watching this. Oh, Jerry, Mr. Pierre is waiting for me. You can pick up your car later. Mr. Pierre is not a mechanic. He is a hairdresser. If he does your hair, he's a mechanic. <laughs> How about these bills? You know, Jerry, sometimes you can be very mean. I'm sorry, Carol. I like your hair. I really like your hair, and I don't think you should change it. Really? You like it this length? I love it. Well, Larry likes it shorter. I don't know, maybe I can get another permanent and then uh, then have it... Uh... Welded? <laughs> <laughs> so rude. Perfect timing. Perfect timing. Yes. <laughs> so innocent. There's another... There's a thing that happens right after this, Bob. Do you remember with the elevator... Where your the door opens and the shaft is there, oh, and you yeah. oh yeah, that's a uh, Tom Patchett. Yeah, I forget the. Uh, and I opened the elevator, and at one point, one of the writers was there, dressed in black. Tom Tom um, Patchett. I thought I was yeah exactly. I thought I was I thought I, I was going to die that, that episode. Yeah. <laughs> you had to grab onto the thing, right? It was really you. It wasn't a stunt person. You were actually grabbing on, right? Yeah, yeah. Why is that? I didn't know that was hard. I, the the <laughs> interesting thing about that show was the audience knew we were on the ground floor. There was nothing underneath us. So they had no reason to be nervous because I, <laughs> I, I was about to fall down an elevator shaft. You mean you were acting? I may have been acting. Someone <laughs> might have taken me acting, right? One of those occasions. It's with those Meisner take things. Here we go. Let's watch your Meisner training. I feel terrific. We don't. I'm on top of the world. I am strong. I am invincible. You are a woman. <laughs> Let's hear you roar. Let's hear you leave. Okay, I will leave. Matter of fact, I feel so good. I'm going to take the afternoon off. <laughs> Bob, we're working here. Stop hanging around. <laughs> ah, stop hanging around. A pun. Yeah. Exactly. And that audience, the audience, they, they, there was a gasp. You know, there was a... <sighs> we decided that you, uh, you inspired an incredibly devastating scene from a dramatic TV show around 15, 20 years later. Let's take a gander at the parallel version right. of that scene. I don't resent you, Leland. If anything, maybe I resent myself. For staying with a man who doesn't love you. I really don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> that was Susie's show, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, sorry about that. It's so disrespectful, oh, but it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, I know that you you said I think it was talking to you. Oh, yeah, I was, Seth, I was right? reading an interview with um, you. One of the episodes that you were most proud of is actually an episode that Jim here um, with Howard Hessman with Howard Hessman. That's um, right. That's some right. of my best friends are talk, talk about that. Talk about it. That's right. We never got a lot of credit. We we did some. Did you direct that, Jimmy? I uh, is that where he's he comes out? Yeah, yeah he comes uh, out. Yeah. yeah, I think I did. I don't. I double checked. You did, Jim. I did. Oh God! Yeah. It was great. Yeah, it just was great. Um, and I remember I, uh, from from the show, of course, when um, uh, I don't want to take a lot of time explaining it, but uh, uh, Howard Hesman says uh, that you know they could couldn't decide on a vacation spot or something, and so I said to my, my husband Howard, and Jack <laughs> Jack Riley says. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, and I I had to kind of teach them uh, to uh, to understand people. The pausing. I mean, I'll show it. It's it's done so it's done so off the cuff. I just love it. That if you really care about a relationship, you shouldn't be so so willing to get out of it. Me, I, I'm not the one who wants to give it up. It's him. Well, then talk to him. <laughs> Uh, 
him? Yes, him. Wait a minute. <laughs> this guy's gay. <laughs> Oh, I Jack remember is not, Jack is not with us anymore. Unfortunately, he was he was marvelous. Mm -hmm. I, I remember so Bob. I remember um, uh, over the river and through the woods, the oh, Thanksgiving yeah. show. Yeah, sure. Oh my God, you are you are you're one of the few actors who can really really play drunk, and you're amazing. I did that show with you. I did another show with you where you. You were a little inebriated and try to put a pizza, a uh, pizza pie in a in a cupboard, that's right. and that's it was right. hysterical. <laughs> it was. I, you know, I had to do that when I was in stand up. I had a routine uh, called Charlie Bedlow about this uh, guy who retires after fifty years, and it turns out the only way he lasted at the company was to get drunk every morning. You yeah. know. And so I was used to going into that, coming out of one routine and going right and becoming drunk right away. Um, uh, it, it was a classic. A, a, a drunk thinks that he's the only one who knows he's drunk. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's the great. other people That's... have no idea that, that he's drunk. But you also said, and I asked you, you said uh, you try to stay erect. You don't try to weave. That's, yeah. that's the key to playing a drunk. You know, you try to end up rather than fall down, which I thought was really you know, I, I was also just watching so much stuff. There's so much acting, Bob, that you do just with basically looking around that it's so comedic. This is, this is the clip where you're on a TV talk show, and as soon as the camera goes on, she completely starts insulting you. And it's just a lot of you looking around. It's just, it's I remember, amazing. Oh, I remember that. I love that show, yeah. Take a look. My first guest is psychologist Dr. Robert Hartley. It's been said that today's psychologist is nothing more than a con man, a snake oil salesman, flim-flamming innocent people, peddling cures for everything from nail-biting to a lousy love life. And I agree. <laughs> I'll ask Dr. Hartley to defend himself after this message. <laughs> Just looking. That, that was my favorite. That was my favorite episode, Bob, because wow. you were reacting. You were reacting so wonderful. It, it, it was just. Perfect. I, I was just sitting here watching that, and the three of us were laughing as though we had seen it for the first time. It's hysterical. That was my favorite show, Bob. No, that was a great, it was a great piece of writing. Great yeah. piece of writing. You know, oh, that's yeah. uh, Jimmy and, 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 and Peter, everyone knows that's that's where it starts. It starts right. with the writing. And if you don't have it, you can be I, the I greatest a, actor in the world. And you were doing the stuff between the writing. Exactly. Exactly. You were doing the acting, which is reacting, which is listening. It's we all know there's wonderful writers. We all worked with them, but it takes a guy like you to fill in the spaces between the wonderful writing. You had wonderful writing, but we had you. Mm -hmm. I should ask for more money, you know. <laughs> I think it's after the fact. More money in those days. <laughs> Let me ask you two things. So, Peter, you played the dentist. Do you remember your audition, or was this just an offer and you just got it? Or were you <clears throat> well, uh, I thought it was just an offer. Later, I found out that there were other guys, both before and after me, at the CBS office. I uh, I just thought because I was such a big fan of Bob's and we had worked together in Mexico on Catch 20, uh, 20 Do that I, I was a shoe in but I found out later I was one of uh, a whole flock of guys uh, one of them, my personal friend Charlie Siebert from Milwaukee Wow well, because you know I, I knew you had worked in front of a live audience and that was yeah. I felt crucial Yeah and I, I bought a lot of his records, and I told him that. I, I bought a whole <laughs> it's box always good him. to kiss ass. <laughs> it always helps. <laughs> I, have, um, I have a real clip, and I'm going to show a parody. So this is the actual film that was parodied by you guys. You've come to fight as three men. And three men you are. 
What will you do without freedom? And then we have Bob and um, Peter. You, you come to find you come to find us free, man. What? What? What will you? What will you do with that freedom? Will you fight? Bob, have you seen the teeth on these Brits? I can make a fortune. It's <laughs> a great joke. <laughs> what the heck? What the heck was that? <laughs> you are in it. Yeah, I know, but what? It, it wasn't part of the New Heart show. What, no, it was, it was Braveheart. It was Braveheart. Billy was, was it? in it too. Billy was, was in it. Saturday Night Live? Was it uh, what? No, what? it was. Um, it was some special, right? Yeah, yeah. It was a. Uh, was it the Smothers Brothers or? No, no. It, it wasn't it, Saturday Night Live. No, well, it wasn't, I don't know. No. It costs a lot of money. They, they, they got a horse and blue makeup. That's a real horse and two cameras at least. Um, uh, all right, we have to go to our medical break, right? We're going to go to our medical break and then um, New Heart. But uh, Peter and, and Jimmy, thank you so much. So for, cool uh, to see you guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Bye, Jim. Appreciate it. I love Bye. you guys. Those I'm are great off. times. They're great Bye -bye, times. Bob. Yeah. Bob, let's go out for dinner, okay? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> bye bye. Bye, bye Peter. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye, Jim. Bye, and thank Bob, you. we'll see you in a few minutes. Five minutes. Five Terrific. Minutes. Terrific. Okay. Thank you guys. You picked some great clips. You really did. Oh well, oh. there's amazing material to choose from. That's thank right. You. Embarrassment of riches. Thanks, yeah. Bob. See you soon. <laughs> All right. Please welcome to Stars in the House, our friend, Dr. John LaPook. Hi guys. How are you? Hi, John. Are you Where in an are you? Undisclosed location? Okay, so here it is. This is the first time we're vaccinated. Our friends are vaccinated. We're over their house right now having dinner. Oh, For the hi. first time without masks, very emotional. Uh -huh. like, fewer, fewer than 10. There's just four of us. Thank you. And um, we hugged till there was no more hug left in us. But uh, nice. this is whatever. Bob Newhart and Jimmy Burroughs. Oh my gosh, what a. What guests you have tonight? <laughs> I know, right? I know. So, so John, we don't want to keep you too long from your from your special. Yeah, what evening, course? So have you eaten yet? Are you between? We dessert? ate. We ate. We're just between the main course. It was Thai food uh, take in or take out. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Waiting for dessert. I, uh, I mean, there's so much to talk about. So why don't why don't we? You want to pick one because we haven't seen you in five days. So yeah. Uh, I, I will tell you the one, which is there's been a lot of talk. Every radio station's wanted to talk to me about it, which is this New York Times article saying how maybe we won't make it to herd immunity. You know, maybe we right. won't get up to 70 or 80 percent. And that's so I actually called Tony Fauci about that to say, like, give me perspective about this. And he said, you know, here's the thing. It's not a magical number. You know, the herd immunity number. Um, it, you, the more people get vaccinated, the more protection there is. And there has been a dramatic, I actually did the calculation, 80% drop in cases and deaths since January 8th. Wow. So, wow. you know, Israel got to about 60% of people having at least one shot and had a dramatic drop off. So here's, I think, how people need to think about it. We are a heterogeneous country. And there's areas of the country that are lit up right now. Oregon's lit up and there are other areas. And, you know, you just, we can't control everybody. But you can control your local neighborhood. So start with your house. So Kate and I got vaccinated. Our two kids, our two sons got vaccinated. And now we're at the house of two friends who got vaccinated. Okay, that's our protective bubble now. That's our, we have herd immunity here. Among right. The, among the that's four a way to look at it. Now, think about it in terms of some pride for your neighborhood. So let's expand that bubble to include the neighborhood, the uh, wherever you are in New York. Have your friends talk to their friends so that your neighborhood can get vaccinated and maybe you have protection there, a little semblance of herd immunity. Goes from the community, maybe to the town, the village, the city, the state. And now you have the potential of these coalescing little bubbles of immunity that eventually will get together and form a protective region. Right. So um, I think that's the way people should think about it and, you know, try to, uh, you can't control. You can't. You can't um, convince the world. You can't convince the world to uh, to. This is some um, the, the two other people in the house who they may not want to be on TV. There you go. Um, um, but anyway, they're vaccinated. Everybody's vaccinated. 
two daughters. Um, so you don't have to, you don't have to vaccinate the country. Um, think about your neighborhood, and I think that's the way to do it. I okay. really do. I mean, it's it's definitely a less stressful way of viewing things because otherwise, I think I'll go crazy if that's all I think about is like, why isn't everyone vaccinated? You only have some sort of control over your own circle of friends and family that you can talk to and communicate to the importance of it if they haven't done it already. Yes, and everybody has their own sense of what their risk tolerance is. If you want 0 0.00000 risk, you're gonna stay home. Right. You know? That's not, and you know, you've seen these charts about the risk of getting hit by lightning, the, you know, all the stuff, basically greater than the risk of a one in a million side effect. Um, so I think we have to start getting back towards normal, which we're going to do. You saw that the announcements of Broadway, uh, you know, opening up again. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how people do that. I've been imagining going into a Broadway theater um, and I would scope it out. What's the ventilation? I'd probably walk in. Uh, I might walk in depending upon if they have testing. So home testing. We just did a piece a couple of days about it. That's going to be a big thing so i just did my first one i did one today for the first time which one did you do i want to say abbott. trubia, abbott. trubia is like, what is it called A the abbott lucera um, oh that's it that's it with the l yeah i have so, it right here you know, these, easy. these are easy um they have to be at least 90 percent accurate compared to a pcr which is the gold standard in order for the fda to give it an emergency oh. use authorization oh. so it may not be perfect it may test negative today because you don't quite have enough virus in your nose and in two days you'll be positive but as um rochelle walensky who's the head of the cdc told me a couple of days ago when we were talking about it, she said okay you test negative today but then if you do it every two or three days you'll test positive in two to three days so it it, it if you use it and if it's cheap enough right now the price of them is anywhere from 24 to 55 dollars that's too expensive it's got to be three to four dollars subsidized by the government paid for by insurance whatever um and then you know there are some false positives there are some false negatives the false positives can be scary when you know, i've seen that happen a few times where you think you know suddenly you're testing positive but you do a pcr and it's negative so you you're worried for a bit but then you can calm down with that and the false negatives happen but dr minna michael minna from harvard who is an expert on this said you know what you need so much virus to infect somebody else that if you have a good test and it's really negative for the next several hours at least the odds of the odds of you infecting somebody else go way way down oh, and you can imagine time. for people who are not vaccinated and you go like kids going to school people who can't be vaccinated um, this is something for them to use. And the last thing I'll say, and then you go back to Bob Newhart, is um, we're going to do a story in a few days. But again, you always hear it here first on Stars in the House. We are concerned about, there's some good evidence that people who are on immunosuppressive medications, you've had organ transplants, which is about a half a million people who have had a kidney or a heart, and then you have to take medicine to stop from rejecting that organ. That same medicine can make it hard for you to mount an immune system to the vaccine. Same thing, maybe, 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 we don't know, for people who have lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and are on much lighter immunosuppressive medicine. We're not sure what the effect of that is on your immune system. So I would say right now, although this is not an official recommendation from the CDC, this is just my thinking and some of the experts I've spoken to, talk to your doctor if you're one of these people about getting tested for the spike antibody. That's the specific antibody that's elicited by the vaccine. It's an antibody against the spike protein. This is not the antibody against the what's called the nucleocapsid antibody, the nucleocapsid antibody, which a year ago when you wanted to see if you got the COVID infection, you would see if you got a positive antibody. Remember that? Right. That was an antibody to nucleocapsid. If you take that antibody and you have not had an infection and you take the nucleocapsid antibody test and you've had the vaccine, you will test negative. It will not pick up the antibody to spike protein. So you have to get this, you have to make sure they order the right antibody, the antibody to the spike protein. It's available now. So if you're one mm. of these people who are on a medication that's lowered your immune system, I, I would strongly consider, I would talk to your doctor or your clinician about it because you may have a, sol a false sense of security and thinking that you're protected, thinking you have a big immune response when you really don't. Maybe you need a booster. And we have, right. we, we're going to follow a patient who actually did that. The first two doses didn't really give him a good response. He got another booster 
and then he had a ton of antibodies. So I think we're working, we're figuring our way with this. We're feeling our way around. All right, John. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Like this, how do you like this Frankenstein lighting from above? That's it's creepy. <laughs> it's creepy. <laughs> All right, we'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye. I love that he just he'll pop in during his dinner. It's very he's in a car is in a park. He's very kind. All right, let's please welcome back Mr. Robert Newhart. <laughs> Hi Bob. Hi Bob. Hi guys. That was very interesting. Very interesting. He's now he's always talking to Tony Fauci, his best friend. It's fascinating. Um, I have two things to ask and you. And he's and he's a CBS guy, just oh, like yeah. you. Oh, exactly. okay. CBS your back correspondent. Can you tell everybody why your book is called I Shouldn't Even Be Doing This? Yeah, that's from um, that. That's kind of a feeling I had every time I walked uh, in, in when I was doing stand up. I, I walked on stage. Um, it, it comes from a joke. Um, <clears throat> it, it's uh, Elizabethan times, and uh, this night is is uh, is is with the the queen. And, and they're um, very much in love. And, um, and the, the, the queen yells out, kiss me, kiss me, kiss me. And the knight says, I, 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 should, I shouldn't even be doing this. <laughs> exactly. That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> now you remember the title. Um, okay, so we are going to go to your second hit show. Oh, every looking every 10 years. Do you want to bring on everybody? Sure. Let's let's bring on Stephanie, otherwise known as Julia Duffy. Hi. Hi, Bob. Hi, Julia. Julia. Uh, drink. I watch the old show too. So <laughs> your lighting is fantastic. All right. We got to bring up, we have to do this the next the next three in order. That's why I have my glasses on because I want to make sure. I just know them as Larry, Daryl, and his other brother Daryl, but I got to go in order. So the first one is, of course. William Sanderson, otherwise known as Larry. Hello, hello. Hi, Bill. Hello and hello. And we have his brother, Daryl, otherwise known as Tony. Hi, Tony. Good evening, all. Hello. Hi, Tony. And then his other brother, Daryl, a.k.a. John. Hi, John. Hey, guys. You're <laughs> <laughs> <Here> the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Upstaging. <laughs> hey, everybody. Bob, Bob Newhart, how did the idea for this show come about? This was only a few years after the Bob Newhart show. It's about four years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I had the, the idea was I was trying to take the elements that seemed to make the Bob Newhart show work. And um, <clears throat> and and tr try to incorporate it into a, a new show. And uh, my wife and I, Ginny, and I were up in uh, Seattle. I was, I was doing stand up at a, at a theater, the Paramount Theater, I believe. And um, we were staying at a, at a very small Hilton hotel. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and to me, it um, it kind of had the elements that had made the Bob Newhart show successful because. Um, we had the the the, uh, the 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 people working at the inn, at, at the inn, and uh, and then we had the uh, Julia, of course, was a maid, Tom Poston, <clears throat> and and then we we had the people who stayed at the inn, and uh, the, 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 if I may explain how Larry Dell and Daryl came about. Um, <clears throat> We found it, it was in Vermont. The show took place in Vermont, and which gave us a, a chance to do like town meetings and all those things uh, that, that are peculiar to the, the north, the northeast. And so we found that a witch's body was buried in, in the basement, and um, it made uh, made Joanna very nervous. And uh, she said, "You know, Bob, uh, Mary Fran." Said you, you know, you have to. I, I can't, I can't sleep at night knowing that there's a, a witch's body buried in in our basement. And I said, well, I'll, let me see what I can do. And so I looked in the the yellow pages, and um, there was this, uh, anything for a buck. That was the name of the company. And uh, I, 
<laughs> I called him up and I talked to Bill. And uh, I, 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 uh, I said to him, you know, this has to be done today. And he said, well, we're, we're real busy. Uh, you don't mind me doing your bill. <laughs> no. uh, no. we're, real, we're real busy, but um, uh, we, we couldn't get to it till next Thursday. He said, well, um, he said, what was it just out of curiosity? And I said, well, we have a witch's body buried in our basement and, and we have to excavate it. And he said, we, we'll be right over. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I think that this clip is when you first meet them right here. Hi, I'm Larry. This is my brother Daryl. That's my other brother Daryl. <laughs> so, uh, how you doing? Okay, except to throw my back out last week crawling under a house. Sounds like a tough job. Wasn't a job. I just like crawling under houses. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that proved? Because then the guys went out. You must have been on almost half of the, the rest of our shows, the eight years of, of Newark. Wow. Um, again, we, we did it in front of a live audience. <clears throat> and some com comedy shows are done in single camera without an audience. And, and if we didn't have an audience, they told us how much they loved these guys. And, and when the show was over, I mean, they, every time they walked in, they got a standing ovation. And, and every time they left, they got a standing ovation. And uh, I said to the writers, I said, we got to have these guys back. Well, if we were doing a single camera show, we would never have known that. So that, that's how important the, the live audience is to uh, especially three camera shows. Well, I was going to ask this. I was going to ask Bill and Tony and John were. Did, was this just written as a as like a one shot deal, and then what? Yeah, talk, talk about that, Tony. It seemed to be one. one oh yeah, it's, uh, it was. As far as I know, there was no uh, there was no intention to carry him on, uh, to carry the actors on. And uh, as far as I knew, uh, certainly this was a one shot deal, and I just thought it was fantastic to be able to work with Tom Poston and. And um, Bob Newhart, yes. for God's sake! I mean, there's, there's a, uh, my resume just glows. Uh, but uh, no, uh, as far as we knew, it was a, a one shot deal. Yeah, wow. And we were, we were amazed to come come back again. At least I was. I was quite uh, quite amazed. And Bill, and Bill, had, Bill yeah, had, so great. had played yes. had played heavies. You pretty much, Bill, had you up until that time. Yes, I had, and there was a little bit of a previous town crazy or two that I'd played in New York. When I came in to do that scene, I, you know, I was thinking a little too much about, I, w I was afraid, I was I'm, I'm impolite in watching it, you know, was a, wasn't mm -hmm. a job, you know, I, I just look at it. I, yeah, I... Uh, had some old characters stuck in my mind when I was doing that, but thank goodness it worked all right. And uh, hey, Bob, thank you for mentioning vignettes earlier. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, what Larry, Daryl, and Daryl did were vignettes. We didn't sure. come in and tell a joke, and uh, we were certainly on the edge of the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, Maybe that makes sense. I don't know. And it totally did. Julia, you you weren't in the very first show. You came on in the beginning of the second season. Is that right? Yeah, what was it like entering a show that was a hit? Uh, I well, I was doing a guest shot the first year, and I was just oh. excited because I got to work with Bob. And <laughs> I was doing another series at the time, so okay. I didn't think anything of it as far as it continuing. And the other show was canceled. And on the same day, they asked me if I wanted to be a regular on Newhart. Wow. Playing that character. So it was quite the roller coaster of emotions on that day. Oh, my God. Within a 15-minute wow. segment. Yes. And then what? I was devastated, and then I was thrilled. <laughs> Manic. And, you know. Thank, thank God for Julia. Thank God for Julia. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, and unfortunately, we couldn't get a hold of 
of Scolari, of Peter Scolari. Yeah. yeah, Peter couldn't, uh, I'm so frustrated. And then, but Julia, what was it? What was it like working with someone that you idolized? Was it one of those like, don't meet your heroes? Or was it like, <laughs> turns out he's great? No, it was a good thing I met my hero. And uh, it was, it made the audition very easy because mm. I knew his work so well. I knew what would work with him. I, wow. I had no doubt what would be uh, a good thing for Bob to react to. And I deliberately, <laughs> hammed it up in ways that weren't in the scene because I knew so well what Bob's reactions would be. And it would be all about his reactions. So that made it easy. As far as working with him, well, there was the one time in the first season, they had me uh, talking on the phone to my parents a lot because I'd left home kind of under a cloud. And uh, I had this long phone call where I'm talking to my parents and he's walking across the stage as I'm rehearsing it and he stops and he's watching me carefully. And I thought, oh my God, Bob Newhart is watching me do a humorous phone call. <laughs> and when I was done, I said, don't watch me do phone calls. And he said, <laughs> isn't it? I said, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> I remember we did one scene. I remember with Julia, and, um, <laughs> and she was telling me, and she seemed very upset. And I said, "What? What's wrong?" And she told me this story about. She said, "You know, you think that people are just always going to be there, and and and, and they'll always be part of your life." And uh, Tony. Okay. Is that Peter? Right. That's Peter Starr. Right. Is it Peter? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, and, and she was terribly depressed. And I I said, well, you know, I thought she had lost a very close member of the family. And I said, well, you know, people people leave, but uh, th their memory always st stays with you. I said, so what, what, you know, Stephanie, what's wrong? And she said, my hairdresser moved out of town. <laughs> I remember that. And then yes. every time I tried a different hairdresser, I'd come in and he would say the wrong thing. He'd say, oh, it looks good. And I go, no, no, it's horrible. And then I'd come in with the exact same hairdo and he'd say, oh, he didn't do it right. And I go, no, this is perfect. And just went back and forth. He couldn't say the right thing ever to me. <laughs> Here's a clip where it's a classic um, moment for for both you, Julia, and Bob. And this is the scene where um, Joanna's just been the doctor's just come from from visiting her, and she's got the measles. And I love your reaction and Bob's reaction. So he's coming down the stairs. I think a guest in the in the inn has measles, and so does Joanna. Here it is. Well, I examined your sick guests and your wife. And they're fine. Really? Yep. Apart from having the measles. <laughs> measles? Then they aren't really fine, are they? It can't be measles. Joanna doesn't have spots. Going to. Well, I don't want to catch it. Isn't there a colony you can put her in or something? <laughs> <laughs> so shallow. So classic. <laughs> yeah, you chose a clip where I was pregnant in real life and tried to make that feather duster cover it up. It didn't do a very good job. Oh I God. didn't even notice that, really. I was concentrating on the comedy, Julia. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> very good illusion. <laughs> so then, Daryl and Daryl, with the not speaking, what was your audition like? Was it more so, more so? Like, what did you guys yeah. just do? Tony. Well, John's on the phone. There's a lot of phones between yes. Daryl. And Daryl. <laughs> well, actually, uh, actually, they they had me read uh, the uh, Larry part. Aha. Uh -huh. So uh, I, I guess they had everybody do that, and then they oh. just picked who would be the, you know, uh, what, whatever echelon of Larryness you had, and who could be a oh. uh, a Daryl. <laughs> so may I may I say they listened as well as anybody I've worked with. And um, they would come in, uh, may, you may know or not know, uh, 
the first. What else did we have to do? And hear every <laughs> well react. Oh, yeah. But well, uh, I've done what you did since that show, and it's not so easy. They didn't, uh, this actor or star of the show, the client did not want me to talk. So it's difficult what you did. And I'm grateful that the casting director from uh, Mark Tabor Forum saw you both hmm. and brought you in. Hmm. Thanks for putting up with me. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> it, no, it was a delight. It was a delight. I liked Larry okay. He voted for him for mayor. The other character did not vote for me when I ran for mayor. And uh, somebody said something to him. He, one of the producers, he said, oh, no, no, I'm not voting for him. So they had their own character. They did. Which it's was true. Obvious. Yeah. And they did speak once. Yeah, they, they spoke once. So, I mean, skip to the finale. That right. finale was filled with surprises. Um, and one of them was Daryl and Daryl got to uh, to speak. For the first time. And, and you know, um, we uh, we had the one we had one word that was the, the only the only time we spoke, we had one word, which was quiet. And just before we came on, we were doing the scene, we I jokingly said, Come on, John, let's run our lines. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we said, shut up. We got the one line wrong. We were supposed to say quiet, and we said shut up. No. <laughs> oh, honest to God. Honest to God. Thank God it was backstage. You know. Yeah. So much fun. And can I tell you if I can make quicken it? Tony, uh, anarchistic streak in him, you know, and he's always happy to have a job like all of us. But he said, you know, guys, this thing's working so well. Maybe when they ask us to talk, we just won't talk. You know? What if what if Tony had said, I'm not going to say that word. <laughs> I just love that. You know, it's working all the time, all the time. And then we found that, Tony, you got to be on um, one of our favorite game shows, merging both Newhart shows. Yeah, there's a lot of like the the Bob Newhart show with Newhart. And I found this. I just want to show it real quick because it's it literally aired on my 18th birthday, July 6, 1987, and I just found it, and it's Tony, well, you'll see. It's Password. It's Super Password. Our special guest this week, Marsha Wallace. And from New Heart, Tony Pappenvoice. <laughs> oh, my God. my God, you you got to see that they aired that because the week it was supposed to be on. Um, who was that? Uh, who was that idiot Marine uh, huh? that they had they had in front of uh, you know a, 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 a Iran Contra deal? Oh, oh Ali North. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, they put him in front of Congress the week that that thing was supposed oh, to be. We talk about people. Well, I know there were a lot of people that didn't like Oliver North, but that week I despised that. <laughs> I couldn't see myself on Password, and I thought it was gone forever. I, you had to wait forty uh, years to see it. Yay! Yeah, there it is. I'll send you the clip. I'll send you the I'll clip. You. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll treasure it. Okay. But and Bob, the other amazing worlds colliding is on the New Heart Show. You you decide to go to therapy, and the audience completely flipped out when coming out of your new therapist audience um, office door. They saw a blast in the past. This is such yeah. a brilliant moment. So this is from the New Heart Show, not the Bob New Heart Show. He's at a therapist's office, and who comes out? What are you staring at? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, you, 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 look, you look so... What's this, guy? Is there another one of your nutcases? <laughs> there's, there's something about, about your face. That... I'm not too crazy about yours, either. <laughs> ha have, haven't we... Well, one... I'd love to stay around here and listen to you stutter all night, but I have a life to live. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great Jack Riley. Fabulous. Oh, um, my gosh. I stutter all night. It's so rude. Oh. <laughs> it's so hilarious. 
Do you want to show this? That's yeah, I want to ask you, Bob, how did you hook up that hilarious moment on the Emmy Awards where Ben Stiller had that wax museum of dead comics? <laughs> you were one of the wax figures. That's so brilliant. Who came up with that concept? And Ben Stiller is a big fan. Like, how did it all happen? That was Ben's idea. That was Ben's idea. He, he, uh, he, and I loved it. And uh, it's, it got a great reception at the, uh, at the Emmys. I, I guess you have it on. You have it on tape, but uh, uh, no, it's Ben's idea. And I said, hey, Ben, it sounds very funny. I mean, you literally see like complete frozen <laughs> wax, like Lucille Ball, who died like 35 years ago. And then the camera pans over to Bob, who's completely frozen with his head down. It's so brilliant. And Ben's speaking of him in the past tense. What would Bob think today if he could see how the rules have changed? Imagine his surprise if he saw some of tonight's nominees, like Fleabag, a comedy about a sex addict, or Barry, a funny show about a cold-blooded ben, killer. Ben, Ben, oh. Ben, I'm, I'm still alive. Yeah, no, I, I knew that. No, I don't think so. You put me, you put me with George and, and, and Lucy in this. This yeah. weird <laughs> wax museum of comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. It's so funny. John, you're back. John. Hi, John. Hey, hey guys. John. Pardon my glitch. That's okay, John. B before we wrap up here, I. I did you have an actor? Do you have an actress fun story? Oh yes. I do. I do. I, a couple of times, a couple of times, I went to the actors fund and they helped me with uh, rent in my early career. And then, uh, once again, like uh, in the nineties, and How they've always been very positive. It's been. I'm, I'm very happy to that they helped me out. Wow, that's they so have, great. They also helped me yeah. out when I was in my twenties. Really, really, Julia. With Me you, too. was it with was it with guidance or was it with financial assistance? I didn't realize they gave guidance. I could have used that as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I just ask for money. And, you know, they don't even ask you to pay it back. If you need it, you need it. I had something to do with. I don't think it was rent. I think I wanted to t keep taking whatever lessons I was taking, whatever class, acting wow. class, singing lessons, or something. I couldn't swing all that I wanted to keep doing. And of course I did pay it back, but, um, uh -huh. and I've given donations because I remember how helpful it was. And I was so stunned when somebody told me that, that I could do that. It hadn't even occurred to me. And when I called, they were like, yeah, how much do you need? So. Wow. Oh, that's so wonderful. And they, we were talking about, in terms of the guidance last week, we had somebody on, and you get your health insurance through equity. And of course, no one's been working in theater for the last year and she lost her insurance and she called the Actors Fund and they talked her through how to get brand new health insurance. I mean, they, they do do guidance as well, but your line reading was amazing. <laughs> it was very Madeline Kahn, I appreciated it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we, we have to show the- well, before, we, before we leave, yeah, we have to show the, the time when, when uh, Daryl Darryl Darryl. Darryl actually spoke. And we noticed that, well, let's first watch it. Oh, we want to first watch it, okay? Because yeah. there's a special guest on here. Okay. <laughs> so I say, Seda, Zora, those three guys are going to be our future hubbies. <laughs> swear to God. So we start to mosey over to the dream boats when these lugs bump into us and knock us on our keysters. <laughs> we went dripping in gin. Uh oh, it was Scott. You're both wrong. As I live and breathe, it was amaretto. It was gin. I know what I stunk like. Hey, I don't know And what James made me realize, I didn't realize that the woman with the black wig is Lisa Kudrow. I didn't yeah, even yeah, recognize yeah, her. Right. Yeah. It's shocking. So that whole finale was so brilliant. It's so much pressure to make it brilliant. And I know everyone always asks you, but who did come up with the concept of you and Suzanne Pochette in bed at the end? My wife, my wife, Jenny. Um, she, uh, if we have time. Um, sure. We were at a Christmas party in, in Beverly Hills, and uh, they were taking pictures, of, you know, so we were waiting in line to have our picture taken with the host and hostess. And um, 
and it was the sixth year of Newhart. And I, I said to Ginny, you know, you know, they, they keep moving us around. They, they, we, we really established nine o'clock as a hit time slot, and they'd move us to eight thirty and nine thirty. And I said, uh, you know, I'm, I, I think this is going to be the last year of, uh, of, of Newhart. And, um, and Ginny said right away, she said, uh, if it's the last show. You should you should end it uh, on, on a dream sequence where you wake up in bed with Susie <laughs> and tell her this weird dream you had about owning a, an inn in Vermont. And I said, "Oh, honey, that's a great idea." Uh, and Susie was at was at the, the same party, and she said, "If I'm in Timbuktu, she said I'll be back in a New York minute." So. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, we, we went on for two more years, and then then when it, it was finally uh, the last year, I, I went to the writers and said, uh, this is the way I think you should end it. So, uh, And yes, it got incredible, uh, incredible uh, reaction. But Bob, you, you also, it was also kept a secret from yeah, a lot how? of people, right? How did you do that? How did you give it a secret? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we kept, we kept Susie a... Uh, the, the funny thing was, in the scene, I told her, I told Julia, uh, and I, I think, and, and the guys, and what the ending would be, and uh, but we hadn't told the, the crew, and so they went to dinner uh, before we were going to shoot the final show, and we had Susie like two or three sound stages over, and. Um, and so uh, they came back from dinner, and uh, Dick Martin directed, as a matter of fact, the final episode. And uh, <clears throat> we we said we've uh, we've added a scene, so just you know, camera A, you just stay on the, and B and and C, you just stay on the on the shot. <clears throat> and and they uh, pulled back a float, what they call a floater, to to block to disguise the scene, and and it was the the bedroom scene, and it got applause. The people applauded the bedroom scene before it was ever revealed that Susie and I were in it. I mean, they just, they just knew, uh, you know, they just, they just knew the show that well. Yeah. They um, recognized that set. Which I thought was interesting. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. did you film a fake ending to confuse people? Did you have a separate ending also, or you, you never filmed another ending? There, there was an alternate ending that I think we shot. Um, Julia, you might know better than I did. Well, uh, I, I can't remember now if we shot it, but we had a script with a fake ending. <clears throat> so that that's what would circulate, and I think they let it circulate in order. Oh, that's to right. We we did it. We because we were afraid of uh, some of the tabloids, um, you know, ruining the ending. We put in a phony ending. We put in a, a whole script of uh, where I go to George Burns as God, and we had this conversation. Mm -hmm. and that, we never we never contacted George or anybody because uh, we, ne we knew we, were gonna, we weren't going to shoot it. Right. And, uh, and one of the tabloids got a hold of it and said, final of episode of Newhart, and, uh, and it wasn't. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, we got the, I remember, because I Julie reminded me of. I remember once they they went to a, a therapist. Julia, you remember her name? She was marvelous. Uh, yes, um, yes. It'll she come played to the, the therapist. And I follow her on Twitter, and I've forgotten her name for a moment. Uh, anyway, yes. Oh, okay. I, I originally went to her because I was a shopaholic. Oh, that's right. <laughs> And then and, Peter and I went because we were having relationship problems because he saw somebody else or something. And I remember, and, and she said, you are the most vapid couple I've ever met in my life. Uh, and Julia and Peter both said, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 uh, that was wonderful. Just I, wonderful I, memories. Thank I, you. I just have to say that to me, it's it's a close call between the world's smallest horse and that's the, true. That's the true. first book beat where the guy came on, the general who had been exploring the Amazon. 
Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I just yeah. I barely got through that show. It, you, I'm telling you, look at that clip because it is the best Bob Newhart of all the Bob Newhart reactions you will ever see. And recently, Stephen Fry put it up on Twitter and said that this is what comedy is all about. So wow. one comedy legend was calling out another, uh, uh, shouting out to another comedy legend. And he put I up did, the I didn't know that. I, I, I didn't know that. And I'm telling you, I was laughing as hard as I was the first time. His reaction to interviewing this guy who's very esteemed general or something, exploring the Amazon, and then he sees dinosaurs and aliens, and he has to sit there on live TV. And <laughs> <laughs> All about the reactions. It's the best. Peter, Peter had found the guest. Peter had found the... Uh, the author of the of the of the book up the Amazon. I think that was the title up the Amazon. Right. He got you. He said, I don't know something about somebody canceled, and we have twenty minutes of the show to fill. And he brings in this guy, and Bob keeps keeps listening to this guy, and then looking back for help. And somebody just keeps going like that, and he goes, "I think we have to go to a commercial." And they go, "Oh no, lots of time left." That was very good. Very good. Fabulous. The guy was fabulous. <laughs> Always looking around. Well, let's show that finale just because this is live. We'll see the actual audience reaction, how brilliant this was. So yeah. people don't know it's the very, very final moment of the new heart, of just new heart. Ready? One, two, three. Okay. Bob, what is it? Well, I, I was an innkeeper in this crazy little town in Vermont. I'm happy for you. Good night. No, nothing, nothing made sense in this place. I mean, the, the, the maid was an heiress. Her, her husband talked in, in alliteration. The, the handyman kept missing the, the point of things. And then there were these three woodsmen, but <laughs> only one of them talked. That settles it. No more Japanese food before you go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's brilliant. What a legacy, man. Thank you all so much, Bob. Oh, thank you. It this was a really special night and, and we appreciate it. I know the actress fund does too. Wow. Thank you. So many fans watching. Thank you everybody. Um, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Peter, I would. Hi you. All. We, we didn't mention Tom Post and we should have, he was such, such an important part of the show. Oh man. My favorite such person. Oh my yeah. God. Yes, indeed. We, we would laugh all day long and, kind of rehearse, but mostly making each other laugh. And sometimes Tom would just throw back his head laughing and say, and we're getting paid. And it really oh, was. And he so helped it was. Us. All of this. <laughs> then he said, once he Guys, said, thank oh, you for you the work you is... did. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm excuse sorry. me, Bob. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to thank uh, uh, James and, uh, and Seth. Uh, you did an incredible job. Yeah, you uh, really Good. Nice, such time. fans. And oh, William, what, what were you going to say about Tom William? Oh, he was very kind and uh, offered advice. And he once said uh, about uh, us surviving together, Larry Darrell and Darrell. He said, "All you have to do is love and respect each other." And uh, we oh. tried. He said a few other things, but I can't repeat them. <laughs> the, the, note, with the, the filthiest jokes you've ever heard yeah he had some good ones. <laughs> yeah. we're uh, g-rated all right, we thank, you, all right thank you everyone we'll see you tomorrow for our game night celebrating mother's day a few days in advance and um we'll see you all tomorrow bye new heart bye thank you. Thank you. that was fun Thank you.